All right, we're live. Hey, welcome to um, Evangel's first ever Sunday morning live stream. Um, you're going to laugh about this, but we actually have been thinking about doing this for three months. And so I had been kind of thinking about some of the process of how to get that, that up and running. And so <laughs> here we are. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of laughing about this because um, this Sunday morning stream is to an empty building and if you're, if you're a pastor, you know what I'm talking about. When, when our, our recurring nightmare is showing up to church on Sunday in an empty, <laughs> in an empty building. And um, here we are at 9 o'clock. So Evangel normally does two Sunday morning gatherings. <clears throat> First one is 9 o'clock, the second one 11. And um, both of those gatherings, we, we pretty much fill up this room. And um, here I am, and it's empty. So this is, this, is doing a, this is doing a job of mine. This is doing a mind job for me. But, but um, it's good. And so here we are. We're finally streaming. This will probably become a little bit more normal for us in the future, even when we have people in this room. And some people have said, why, why, don't you guys, why haven't you guys put videos online? Because we haven't. Sarah and I have been in Fort St. John at Evangel for over 16 years, almost 17 years. And we've never streamed or, or put up anything that comes from Sunday mornings in terms of preaching content. We do what we call a sermon jam, which is basically a five-minute summary, and we do that afterwards, sometimes between services, but usually in the week. And so the reason for that is, is on a more, more of a philosophical reason that we've kind of bucked the trend of streaming live online. And, and the reason for that is that the preach or the sermon or even the gathering on a Sunday is such a small, small, small part of the church, the church's life. I mean, our staff spend <clears throat> a very small percentage of their week on the gathering. Uh, it's not unusual for me to go through my whole week as, as the lead pastor here and spend very little time thinking about the Sunday until Saturday before. Um, just because there's so, there's so many other things that, that make up a church. And I think the danger becomes you kind of look at that Sunday morning preach and you think that's, that's all of evangel and it's not. You miss the context. And the context for us on a Sunday morning is so much more than me just getting up here and yakking, yakking your ear off for 30 minutes. Um, if you walk in the back doors, you meet incredible people at the doors. Then you come in, you grab a, a hot cup of coffee and you make your way into this warm meeting space where great music is being played and, and great people are all over the place. In fact, on a typical Sunday at Evangel, you will not get out the doors without somebody hugging you or high-fiving you or, or maybe in rare cases giving you a holy kiss. No, I'm kidding. We, we, we don't do that on Sunday mornings here. Um, but there's context, right? And I think sometimes you miss that. So we've kind of thought, ah, we want people to hear maybe the preach and what's being talked about, but there's so much more going on than just that. Um, anyways, that, I'm just rambling. That's just some of the philosophical reasons why we haven't done this. But here we are, and um, we're, we're on the edge of something new, and uh, some may say our hand was forced here. Um, by the way, if you are watching this live stream right now, um, why don't you just put a yes in the comments? bar and that would I think kind of get the word out there that we are we're going um, we are kind of watching the, the the number of viewers on this and we're noting we're noting that even in virtual church evangel still shows up a little bit late and that's uh, that's okay anyways so we're living in a time unlike anything that's happened before I think whether you have whatever your opinion is on the this time that we're living in around COVID-19 this pandemic uh, whatever your opinion is uh, what you're hearing through me media or, or what you're hearing from the government or whatever, you have to admit this is a time unlike anything we've ever seen. And the world is in, a, is in a situation that some are comparing to wartime, and I think that's actually a pretty accurate way of looking at it, where mass sectors of our society are shutting down. At the same time, other things that are really good, are, I think, that are happening are people are pooling together, pulling together. And um, so it, it's, at the end of the day, it's a season like we've never seen before that we're in right now. And I have personally waffled <laughs> around a lot on this and how serious it is. I mean, just watching um, different news outlets and media things, um, social media. Oh, my goodness. I went on social media this morning just before coming down, and I thought, why did I do that? Oh, 
because there's so many opinions on this from one side of it is we're all overreacting and and we're panicking and we should settle down and and just carry on with life as usual and then on the other end of it um this is the end of the world as we know it <laughs> right that song's been rolling through my head that rem song has been rolling through my head all week and uh I think it's kind of cool that it's a happy song, um, even though it talks about the end of the world. And I feel fine. So you have these opposite kind of viewpoints, and, and, and professionals and very smart people are on both sides of that argument, too, in my opinion. Um, you have guys like Dennis Prager that are still saying on the, on, on the side of just settle down. It's not good. It's, it's, there's nothing to panic about. But then you have others increasingly a larger amount of others that are saying no this is this is really serious we need to take it really seriously and so we actually coming into this week we're we're uh, we're planning on carrying on with services as usual and then uh, I think as we came into Friday Saturday and especially Saturday realized actually we probably should do something at least for this Sunday so this is just a one-off at this point and you'll You'll hear from us throughout the rest of the week whether we actually do gatherings, in, in-person gatherings next Sunday or not. At this point, we're planning on it, um, though I have to admit I think that's unlikely at this point. So we're, we're, in a, we're in a new season with maybe a new normal on us, but we'll see, we'll see how that goes. So here's where we're at as a leadership team here in our church, and, I, and this is kind of how we start on a Sunday. I often don't get right into talking preachy stuff. I just talk family business stuff. So <clears throat> this is particularly pertinent, I think, to you at Evangel. First, our city has requested <clears throat> that uh, meetings over 250 don't happen, and um, that's not an enfor- enforced thing, but it's, a, but it's a requested thing. And though we don't have usually 250 people in each one or the other service, 9 or 11, we definitely hit the 250 mark when we overlap in between services. So between services, we have about a 15 to 30 minute um, overlap period where people are coming in and people are leaving. And, and we often overlap on that end of things. And so we, we wanted to, first of all, honor our city and honor the, the authorities that are over us in our provincial governments and just kind of abide by their recommendations, and we'll continue to do that. So we're going to be keeping really close tabs on what they're suggesting, and we want to do uh, whatever we can just to honor that and, uh, and lead the way in that as well. Secondly, we just wanted, we, we were led to this decision not to do services today just, to, as, just because we feel like we need to be sociably, social, socially responsible as a church, which includes, obviously, doing our part to limit the spread of any illness. Now, if we look around the globe, churches have not been helping in this area in places where it's really broken out. In fact, they've often been the uh, part of the cause of illness spreading. So we just felt like it was the socially socially responsible thing to do. And and look, if we've overreacted a little bit, I'd rather go, okay, we overreacted a little bit than underreact and later on have to um, apologize. I think it's better to overreact a tad here I actually had a convo yesterday with um, a lady in our church who's in the very vulnerable age bracket, and she was pretty happy. <laughs> and she's, man, she's a committed churchgoer. I, I, I don't know of anybody that would probably hold it at a higher level of showing up in church on Sunday, but she was pretty relieved to know that we were going to be going live, and hopefully she's watching live right now. So those are some of the rationale behind this decision and i wanted to say very clearly that fear has no place in us making this decision we're not afraid of this coronavirus and we aren't uh, we're not afraid of death we believe as a christian you really um you really don't have anything to be afraid of so there's nothing in here about fear but being considerate of others and honoring those in authority does and um, even more than that, listening to God's voice and following his lead is, is so important for us in a season like this. And now here's the really crazy thing, and I really wanted to make sure I share this with you this morning. Sarah and I have been very aware of God's leading in the last three months. And so it started three months ago. We have a little cabin that we, we get out to every once in a while. And so in December, earlier part of December, we were in this cab, we, we went out to the cabin for a few days. And one of, our, one, of our, one of the things we wanted to do was spend some time praying together. You know how life is. It's busy, and, and sometimes you just, 
you know, unfortunately, the important things like like Sarah and I praying together get squeezed out and pushed to the back burner. So we're out there in this cabin. It's totally quiet. It's two and a half hours from town. All you could hear was the sound of wolves, literally, in the background. One day for three hours, just howling like crazy. <laughs> That's inspiring, man. Come on. And, um, and so we, we, one afternoon, we decided just to take a few hours just to pray together and listen in prayer together. And so Sarah just found these cards. I don't have them here, but, but we, had, we had written out several different kind of categories of things that we wanted to pray into and listen together. That's one of the things that we're learning these days. And I'm going to tell you right now, in whatever the season ahead looks like, this is where the rubber meets the road around practicing walking in conversational intimacy with God. And that is obviously talking to him in prayer, but also listening to him. So we were praying about several things, and then we thought we need to do some listening around those things. And so Sarah and I have learned that Jesus actually wants to speak into your life in the most practical ways. He does. It's not just about the spiritual side of your life. It's about the practical stuff, your health, your well-being, your future, your plans, et cetera, et cetera, your schedule. We have found that when we let Jesus speak into our lives around our schedule, it's unbelievably crazy how he can take what seems like a, a life with no margin and still do crazy things in that, with, within that packed time frame. So one of the things we were praying about was our holidays for 2020. And so we're, we're, we're talking about New Year's resolutions and things we want to do in the future. And we have, we have some big plans for the future. One of the things we want to do is, is go to Israel. It's kind of on our, our hit list to get to Israel in the next, it, we were thinking in 2020, actually, that was our thought originally. And and then there's a bunch of other things happening. Um, I'm, I'm a part of a coaches network, so we meet a couple times a year, plus different conferences we wanted to hook into. Um, our daughter, Jordan, and son-in-law are, are at Bethel Church in Redding, California, and we wanted to get down there and see them. We just had lots of plans for 2020, and, um, and we're very, very excited about that. So we're doing some listening in December, and we had on our, on our listening things to listen for was holidays and travel plans in 2020. And we heard distinctly, this is so crazy. We heard Jesus say distinctly. Um, and when I say distinctly, I'm not saying we heard an audible voice, but we both sensed, Sarah and I both sensed that Jesus was saying, cancel your plans for 2020. And <laughs> I, I was like, really? Like, seriously, like, are you, are you telling us not to travel anywhere in 2020? And we felt like he was, he was actually saying, no, I want you to, to, to not travel. And to be honest, we both sensed, relief at that point because it could, you know, how traveling kind of creates a bit of a jar to your regular routine and, and it's nice to get away, but it also coming back, it just kind of screws around with your routine. So we actually both felt a little bit of a relief about that, to be honest. And I didn't have, I, actually at that point, I went through my calendar for 2020 and I just went, boom, not going to that, boom, not going to that, and just knocked off a bunch of things in 2020. And we started immediately making plans to then do things around Fort St. John, spend a bit of time in the cabin, um, maybe do some backpacking and hiking around the area. We, we're, we're in one of the most beautiful places on the earth. And when it comes to the summer, man, you got these, you got these 18 hour, 20 hour days with daylight and it's just incredible. So we actually were quite excited about that. I will say that there was, there were, there was one exception and the one exception was this, this trip to Zambia that I just came back from in February. I felt like on that, Jesus was saying, stick to your plans. Although I tell you, it was tempting to drop that too, considering how fast that trip was going to be. But he was like, nope, make that happen. So I did make that happen. But here we are in 2020, and um, we're, Sarah and I have looked at each other a few times watching the news and just kind of chuckled and went, oh my goodness, God gave us a heads up on this as all these travel bans come into place. We have a, a lot of you, part of Evangel, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry for you, I really feel bad about this, but had plans to travel over spring break and you had to cancel your plans. Um, good friends of ours, Nick and Louise Evangeline, were gonna be in the UK for two weeks and now they're here. Um, so I just wanted to say it's interesting uh, to us how God was leading in that way. That was the first thing. And um, the second thing was, this was just a few weeks ago. I had this, <clears throat> so we try, I try as much as I can and our staff do as well and, and our leadership, our church leadership team to really be led by, by Jesus. I mean, I, I know you, you might expect that churches would do that, but Honestly, it's, it's, it's our default to just take the helm 
and Tony take the wheel, <laughs> not Jesus take the wheel. So we try, we're trying consistently to kind of come back to letting Jesus speak. We call it listening prayer. Um, and we just, we're, we're taking time to hear him and give him a chance to kind of lead us. And in, in a nuts and bolts kind of way, you know, like where that actually means we take time in our staff meetings to listen. Anyways, a couple weeks ago, I was just in a personal time of listening and doing some journaling. And I felt like Jesus dropped this idea into my mind at that point to do, we call, I, in my mind, the phrase came church without walls. And, and this was before we had any idea we would be at this point today. Like we had no plans whatsoever to cancel Sunday gatherings. None. And I had, I had this idea drop in my heart, church without walls. And in it, I envisioned maybe every eight weeks or so canceling the in-person in gatherings. And then on that Sunday, breaking people into house churches <laughs> all across the city. And, um, and I envisioned at that point what that would look like is there would be a little bit of a, a there would be a little bit of a live stream like this where I or one of our pastors would just give a bit of a word or speak a bit of an encouragement. And then it would move into say some worship, maybe using YouTube videos or somebody has an acoustic guitar and then moving into some prayer time. This would all happen in houses across the city, maybe gatherings of about 20 people. And then after that prayer time, the best part of that morning would look like this, food, <laughs> food, food, yeah. And we would sit around tables and eat together. And so I had this idea two, two or three weeks ago. I kind of ran it by our staff and they, and our staff team, they know that I'm always, I'm always tossing out new ideas. So I sometimes get an eye roll like, oh man, are you serious? Are you serious about that? And I actually, this to you, this last week, I said to Vadim, Vadim is, is uh, one of our pastors on our staff team and he does a lot of techie stuff. And I said, Vadim, can you line up a, a dummy run on this? Like a, a, a test run on this? And that would have been this week coming. And so he went ahead and did all the work on that and started thinking through how do we live stream on a Sunday. And we were going to do a test run midweek this coming week. Well, here we are now. And the interesting thing about it is we're totally prepared for this. Um, that, so you just look at little things like that and you just, you just see how, how God has been leading all along. And um, that's kind of exciting. The last little piece of that was on Saturday... I was actually hanging out with my brothers and our sons at Silver Star Resort in, just outside of Vernon. We were snowboarding and I was on the hill that day and my good friend Russell Eggleston <laughs> texts me out of the blue and says, hey, I got all this equipment and I, I can set up a live stream. Are you guys interested in that? And that was just um, one of the final things that, I, that for me went, okay, okay, Jesus, I'm listening. And so that on yesterday, that was just yesterday. We called our staff and CLT together and did a quick Zoom call and then made the decision to go, yep, let's go ahead and do this. It seems to be what God is saying. So, so here we are. And um, again, for you guys that were thinking about spring break starting <laughs> and we're going to go to Disneyland, man, I really feel, I, I feel bad for you. And I want to say that here you are in Fort St. John. We are going to continue to do what we do. We prophesy over the weather all the time. So we're going to prophesy that somehow over the next two weeks, the weather shifts from whatever minus friggin' whatever it is right now to something that's a little bit more palatable. So it's not going to be so bad. I will say that uh, when, when the, uh, probably for, for me, when I realized this might be kind of serious was when, you know, billion dollar industries start shutting their doors. Now I kind of think they don't do that unless there's something legitimate, a legitimate reason for doing that. I could be wrong, but um, here we are. And we actually do feel like in this season, the shepherd is leading his sheep. And um, it's good. So I wanted to share a few things, but before I get into that, I'll just, I just, I'll close with a few thoughts and... Um, crack open the word of God and just take you to a few places. But I did want to say by way of announcements that this is so typical of evangel. Sometimes we take 20 minutes on announcements. <clears throat> um, I wanted to say that all other stuff that evangel does, activities and events normally scheduled are carrying on. So unless you hear otherwise, <clears throat> we're in week three of the Hearing God Seminar on Tuesday nights. 
Wednesday nights, we have midweek gatherings that, that go on all, all across the city from youth and young adults to um, gatherings and homes. All of that is going to continue on schedule unless you hear, hear otherwise. So just keep a note on that. We will definitely be letting you know what's going to happen next Sunday and what that's going to look like and what that format will look like as we get to it. So just so in light of that, if you aren't on, like just get connected to social media is what I would say. Um, there's a couple things that you need to do. Um, and let me walk you through that. First is like Evangel's Facebook page because we'll be firing up lots of stuff there um, by way of announcements and, and ways to keep us connected. If, if, we, if, if, our, if BC should go the way of, my, my brother actually lives in Washington State, passes a, a, church, with, a, a church under the Christ the King umbrella, and they have, they have actually reduced gatherings to 10 people. We don't know if that's going to happen in BC, but if it does, the social media and the media platforms are going to be really, really crucial for us to stay connected as a church. And we are going to stay connected as a church. I want you to know that. Um, in fact, the church is not going to shift in its function at all here. We are way, way more than the big gathering on Sunday. And we will continue to function and be the church. The church is not the building that I'm sitting in here. This is a great facility that we meet in um, often throughout the week. But you and I are the church and we're going to keep being the church. And so... If we should go, though, the way of other countries and what we're seeing in the, U the U.S. right now, then social media becomes important. So like the, like the Facebook page, um, become familiar with Evangel's website, evangelfsj.com. And lastly, this is, a, this is another new development here around Evangel that, well, there's a couple new developments. One, we got a mug. I'm actually drinking from an Evangel mug right now. The espresso machine is not fired up this morning, so it's a tea, which is a little bit lame. But other than that, it's all good. Um, the other development, though, is an, an Evangel app. So here's how you get the Evangel app. Listen very carefully. If you have this app, it will really help you stay connected. You'll actually you get notifications right to your phone. Um, all of the videos we're posting will come up, will, will, will be posted through that app. You'll see them show up there, sermon jams, whatever. So it's a great way to stay connected. You can do giving through that app. And we do encourage you, even though we're in a different season right now, to, to continue, continue being faithful and giving. You can do it through the app or you can actually set up a bank account. Many of you already do this. Um, just reach out to us if you need a bank account number, an account number, so you can do online banking. Um, again, like just reach out to us, info at evangelfsj.com, or you can call Evangel 250-785-3386, and we're going to be fully functional here at the office. But get the app, and here's how you get the app. Go to your app store on your phone um, and look and find the app called Tithely. That's Tithely. T-I-T-H-E-L-Y. And once you've downloaded the app Tithely, it's just the name of the company that, that, that helps us with this stuff. Once you've downloaded the app Tithely, then go into that app and search either by city, Fort St. John, or you can type in Evangel Downtown. And it will take you, it'll, it'll set up that app so it's directly connected to Evangel and we post everything there. So basically everything on the website, communications that go out, will all kind of funnel through that, that site, okay? So that's important for you to stay connected as we um, kind of move ahead. And honestly, whether this all blows over in a couple of weeks and life just resumes as normal, if you're connected on those platforms, I think that's a just that's a really good thing to get us more connected virtually. And we and we thank God for technology. I think it's such a crazy thing that we can um, we can have disruptions like this and still and still pretty much carry on with business as usual. So it's super good. So get connected on social media, and that would be a really a really good thing. Um, yes. And we'll see what the future we'll see what the future looks like. By the way, I just want to say this: if there's anybody here watching from another church in town, or or perhaps you're another pastor checking in on this, or you're from Evangel, I think the way forward here is not going to necessarily be to bring exactly replicate what we do here 
into houses, houses and homes, I think there's going to be something different that God does that I'm actually kind of anticipating. I wrote a book not that long ago called Boondock Church, and in it, we cracked open 1 Corinthians 14 a bit. I call it the One Core 14 document because it's, it's incredibly significant when it comes to how the local church functions, especially how it functions around its gathering. Now, before I just crack that open just a little bit, let me just say that the gathering is absolutely, absolutely crucial. We're unashamed about that. The church has to gather. There's three things to make up a church. There, there's got to be a leader. To, there's got to be a pastor. There has to be a, a, a community that's walking together or a congregation, and there has to be a gathering. And so Hebrews 10.25 says, do not forsake the gathering or don't get out of the habit of going to the gathering or the meeting place, especially as the day of the Lord draws near. In other words, the, the, the closer we get to the return of the Lord, or you could say the worse things get in some ways, the more integral becomes the gathering. I know, I know there's a movement in church world right now to say the gathering is becoming less and less important. I tell you right now, it's actually going to become more and more important. And we are all about the gathering. But it could shift a little bit and it could look a little bit different in the next, in the next few weeks, even, even up to the next eight weeks. Um, and when it does, I kind of think it might be a chance to try a few things a little differently. And the one core 14 document that Paul writes to give us some guidelines around how church should look, uh, have, it's, pretty, it's a pretty open-ended thing, but there are some major themes that come through. One is there should always be a worship time. And so we're singing some songs about who God is to God. We're declaring, we're declaring the greatness of our God and the, and the wonderful things about who he is. That's what, that's what the singing part of it is about. And that's right there in 1 Corinthians 14. The second thing, equally important, is there's a learning environment. There's always a learning component. So we're coming together to learn and grow together. And often that's, that's around a scripture verse. Sometimes it's around a prophetic word or a revelation that somebody has. There's always a learning component. And then um, there's always involvement. That's one of the things that I think can be lacking in the big, big gathering is involvement is pretty limited to often a couple superstar preachers and their support staff. And in 1 Corinthians 14, you see a much more open-ended level of involvement, which we actually try to do here at Evangel. Like in the last few weeks, we've seen multiple voices sharing, a lot of them from the trip that we took recently to Zambia, stories of what God was doing, healing um, stories, um, and personal revelations people have been sharing. But it, often in this big gathering, that doesn't happen as much. It just for logistics purposes, it just it's it's hard to pull that off. But we may have an opportunity to kind of shift that up a bit. And so, First Corinthians fourteen, the one core fourteen document around local church gives them room for others to be involved. One person, you know, brings a song. One person brings a revelation. One person brings a prophetic word. Um, maybe a few people have a prophetic word. Well, get in line, two or three, one at a time, and it's all done decent decently and in an order. And the other thing about the first core. For the one core 14 document is when it talks about the local church, and this is so, so, so important, is the idea of prophecy bleeds through the whole chapter. And some would say, well, what, what does that mean, prophecy? Well, Revelation, I think it's 19 verse 10, and I'm just pulling a blank, but says the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So what it means when you see prophecy there is it means that Jesus' voice is ultimately being heard. And I think it's a sad commentary that a lot of times in our church gatherings, my voice is heard, perhaps the worship leader's voice is heard, maybe the announcement person's voice is heard, but is the voice of Jesus heard? Well, we hope it is, but that's something we have to really work at. And so that is part of the, the gathering is that the voice of Jesus is heard. So how does, that, how does that flesh out in our big gathering? Well, we always take time to listen after a preach. We just quiet ourselves. Is there anything Jesus you wanna say? Um, we encourage pro the, the gift of prophecy to be at work in our church. But that might actually be easier to pull off in a, in a smaller context, which we might be, might be walking into over the next little bit. And then the, the last component, which kind of comes through behind the scenes in the One Core 14 document, is that everything that happens in that gathering should be relevant. In other words, the outsider can walk in and get what's happening, and I think that's a, that's a really important thing. But... All that to say um, the gathering is going to continue to be important for us in whatever, whatever context that's going to look like. So in a worst case scenario, looking ahead, 
which we have every reason to believe we're not going to see a worst case scenario. I just want to make sure that's clear. But the, the, the first thing is the church will continue to be the church and it will continue to gather. And uh, we'll just figure out how we do that as we walk along. And we, we will be challenging you, us together as a community, to be, walk, to be walking with Jesus as the church 24-7 so that as the people, as the church, everywhere we go, we're bringing the kingdom and that continues to happen. The church is powerful when it gathers for sure, but arguably more impact into the world around it when it scatters. And so we're kind of the scattered church here for a bit, but it's gonna be um, high impact. Secondly, we're, we're definitely looking at the potential of the house church model. Again, um, we'll be keeping in step with what our city's recommending here and wanna be socially responsible, but there is definitely something exciting about this. And I actually feel like we're ready for this kind of a thing. If you're part of Evangel, you're aware of the fact that for the last almost eight months now, Sarah and I have been, have been personally mentoring 40 leaders in our church every single week. We sit together with 40 core leaders in our church. They are, they are staff, they are our church leadership team, CLT, and they are midweek lead, uh, gathering people, they're worship leaders. And we've been sitting together with these leaders for 40, uh, for these 40 leaders for the last seven or eight weeks. And and each week, it's been a discipleship journey. It's very nuts and bolts. It's very hands-on. And the two things we've been talking about in that, in that mentoring, coaching, discipleship journey is basically, we, we almost want them to be two ruts in the road, to be honest. We're, the road we're, we're on that leads to life and life to the full. And on one, on one side of the road, this rut is learning how to stay connected to Jesus, learning how to abide in Him, learning how to really walk in relationship with God. And again, that may seem like, shouldn't, shouldn't Christians just naturally do that? The answer is absolutely not. <laughs> they do not. This is something we have to work at. And, and so we really get into the nuts and bolts of what does that look like to walk with God on a daily basis. And those leaders have been mentored in that for the last, like I said, seven to eight months. A consistent daily journey. We meet once a week, but they're walking this stuff out every single day. I can tell you what we're seeing in our core leaders is unlike anything I've seen in Evangel over the last 16 years. And the other rut in the road is learning how to be like Jesus and walk like he walked and have the same character that was in him. And this is a really good thing. And this is what we want to do in this season right now. I want to tell you this as the church, the most important thing is that you just keep walking like Jesus walked. And to underscore one of the things we've been discovering lately, I think that's been sort of a bit of a new thing in evangelist kind of way we operate is this idea that as Jesus walked, so we can walk. He's actually a perfect theology. So we can look at Jesus and know exactly what God is like. And, and we, he, as Jesus shows us what God is like, Christians should be sort of a, sort of a type of Christology and that we actually show people what Jesus is like. And so that means walking like he walked. And one of the things we experienced in Zambia was, was the, the amazing deliverances and healings that happened. And, um, that, that's going to continue, man, as you and I learn how to be like Jesus and walk like he did, we're going to see that same stuff happen here. And in fact, we have been over the last three weeks, every single Sunday that we've gathered, people have been healed um, and, and people have been set free. It's been a very, very cool thing. There's no reason to think that that's not going to continue. And we fully expect that, that it will. Thirdly, um, well, I guess I kind of already said that. Thirdly, we're going to, we're just going to keep, keep pushing into this vein that Jesus has been leading us into walking like him including the expectation of signs and wonders. Let me just close with a couple thoughts. Oh man, I'm usually long-winded on Sundays and I guess I'm being long-winded this morning. Just really quickly, um, I just want to close with a few things. And I wrote down a few notes in, in, in my, on, on my yellow pad here. I, I think the opportunity for us right now is, is really, it really comes down to, first of all, um, a, a reset. And... I just saw this, this video on, on Facebook. Somebody posted it. It was kind of a fun video, but this couple were talking about, oh, it's so terrible. I can't go out. I can't go out. I can't do all the stuff I needed to do. Now I have to stay home and Netflix all day, right? Um, and my son Luke and I were talking on the way back as we were flying back from Kelowna yesterday. And we were just like, we were, he was especially <laughs> anticipating. Um, we're both a little bit introvert, the opportunity of being introverted and just embracing that by staying home. Um, 
all that means being sort of tongue in cheek. This is definitely an opportunity to reset, I think. And there's been the, in disruption, there's always an opportunity to reprioritize and think about your life from a different angle. And I just want to tell you, Evangel, that this is your chance to do that. And I would say around, especially two things, around being kingdom first, right? Jesus said this in Matthew 6, verse 33. He said, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. In other words, <clears throat> if you and I can really just kind of like just focus our lives on being about the kingdom and being about what Jesus is up to and about what Jesus is saying and where Jesus is leading us, then the promise is that everything else gets taken care of. And in this age of uncertainty, I mean, like, are you going to find toilet paper on the shelves of your grocery store? <laughs> I mean, whatever. You'll be fine, okay? <laughs> um, but in this age of uncertainty, the promise of Jesus is, seek me first, and there will be enough toilet paper. I couldn't resist that. Um, that's, the, that's the least of our worries, really. But the promise is, seek me first, and I'm going to take care of all the details. I'm going to take care of the details around your health. I'm going to take care of the details around work, around income flow, around all that stuff. Seek the kingdom first. But the reality is, and you know this, we're the energetic city and we live in this, this environment where margin is so tight. We have no margin, in our, literally no margin in our lives, especially around time and finances. And I think that there is an opportunity here to go, okay, let's seriously ask the question, what would it look like if we were first and foremost about seeking the kingdom of God? And what that, you know what that means, what the, what, what the kingdom first looks like? It looks like the prayer of Jesus in Matthew 6, where he said, pray like this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we actually believe that what Jesus is doing and what he's doing through us as believers, he said he would build his church, right? Jesus said he would build his church. No worries about that. He's like, I got that. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Our job is to be agents of the kingdom and to be people that are praying and acting out this the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And that's a good picture when you think of what heaven's like. It's not a dreary place with a forever ending choir in the sky, church service. Oh, God help us. It's way more than that. It's life and all of its perfection. It's the Garden of Eden times 100. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful picture of health and prosperity and blessing and favor. And we're to pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And then I believe we're also to act, we're, we're, we're to act that. The kingdom advances forcefully, forceful men lay a hold of it. And we are to be agents of the kingdom on earth and in our city in Fort St. John. So I, I think this is a good time to reset. Some of you had lots of plans for, the, for spring break. Now you don't have those plans. Maybe, maybe there's gonna be continued disruption in the future where you're gonna find yourself with some margin. Don't fill it freaking with more Netflix. Everybody's saying, here's the Netflix series to watch and just do like a binge, binge watching Netflix thing. Don't, don't go down. I mean, it's okay. It's okay to Netflix and do a little bit of Netflix and, and whatever. Watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy over again. Do the extended version. Do it all in one shot. I, that's fine. But there's, there's a more of an opportunity here than just to turn on the TV and go brain dead. There's an opportunity to be kingdom first. And what that's going to look like on a really practical level is you guys, I'm talking to Evangel here, is that you may have a chance, you may have some margin to go, hey, I'm going to spend time with God every day. Like, wouldn't that be novel? I'm going to crack my Bible and I'm going to do a bit of reading. You know, start wherever. Start in, start in, start in Psalm 1 and start reading forward. Or, or we always say, go to John. Go to the book of John and start doing some daily reading. More than that, get a journal if you don't have one and spend some time writing out your prayers and journaling what God's doing in your life. Take some time to listen to Jesus. Be kingdom first. Be seeking him first. And, and the promise is profound in Matthew 6, 33. He says, I'll take care of, of everything. The other, the other thing I think that comes around this idea of a reset, and I'm going to challenge you in this again. Um, it, you do have an opportunity here to push the reset button. This is perhaps the best opportunity you're going to have in your whole life to push the reset button. And the, um, the passage I wanted just to take you to really quick is Hebrews chapter 4. And in Hebrews chapter 4, I'm going to read it from the message. And this is unscripted. <laughs> I don't even know what the message is going to say, but I think it'll be, it'll be easier to understand than BSV. 
For it says in verse one, for as long then as that promise of resting in him pulls us on to God's goal for us, we need to be careful that we're not disqualified. And then it says towards the end, um, let me see if I can find it here. Jeepers, maybe I should go back to what I know. Okay, I'm going to go back to ESV here. It says in verse 11, chapter 4, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And then it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. But the whole passage of Hebrews 4 is basically, the premise of Hebrews 4 includes a few different things. One is the idea of Sabbath that God instituted when he created the world. And so on seventh day, he took a rest and put into place a rhythm that he, he, that would be, he intended man to live by, not just as a rule that we had to keep, but actually for our benefit. And the idea was, was to take periods of Sabbath rest now, Hebrews 4, the writer of Hebrews is making the case that, hey, because of what Jesus did and, and what we say Jesus did when he, when, he, when he lived those 33 years is that he lived the, the life you and I could never live. And he died the death we could never die. And he paid ultimately the penalty of sin. Because of the cross, we stand justified before God, completely righteous. When God looks at our lives, he doesn't look at you and all of your screw-ups and mess-ups, but he actually looks at you and he sees Jesus in all of his perfection. And so because of this completed work, and now we're on the other end of this, and you can't, you can't earn God's favor. You can't earn God's blessing. You can't earn God's favor in your life. We're on the other end of this. Now we stand completely righteous in Christ because of what he did for us on the cross. We actually can cease striving. And so the idea of Sabbath, the principle, still needs to be in place, okay? Like you, you really should take a day off every week. I mean, shoot, if God did it, you should do it. But the principle now is, is way larger in that because of what Jesus did for us, we no longer have to strive. We no longer have to push. We are fully accepted, in, we are fully accepted by God in Christ Jesus. And so now we can be fully at rest and we can embrace the Sabbath, not just as a one in seven experience, one in seven days, but as a daily reality of being able to go, I don't need to strive today because I'm, I'm resting in God's favor and blessing. I'm his child. He's my father. He's going to take care of me. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of rest. And I think this is just my thinking with what's going to happen in the next little while here, whatever it's going to look like, there may be an opportunity for you and I to get some margin and enter into Sabbath a bit more. It may be the next two weeks over spring break. It may be when, when we come back into the system and uh, what's going to happen with, with school. And uh, we, don't, we have no idea with our kids in school, but there may be an opportunity, a disruption to enter into healthy rest and, and quit the striving, which might look like, um, yeah, maybe some Netflixing on, you know, throughout the week, but, but more than that, making an intentional an intentional connection with Jesus being kingdom first. So lastly, um, I'm going to share, share with you Psalm 91. And I memorized this when I was a teenager and it's stuck with me ever since. I pray it all the time. And I think as many pastors are saying right now around the globe that it's, it's a passage for the church right now. And it says this, he who dwells in the shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of the almighty. I will save the Lord. He's my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare. He will deliver you from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. There you go. <laughs> nor the plague that destroys at midday. Like A lot of people are going like, Psalm 91. I just heard Chris from Bethel Church say, it seems like Psalm 91 was written for the day we're in right now. Um, you will not fear the pestilence. You will not fear the plague. You do not need to be afraid. You do not need to be afraid. You are well um, established in the hand of God, and he has you firmly in his grasp. It goes on to say, 10, 000, though 10,000 may fall at your um, right hand, 1,000 at your left, or something like that, it will not come near you. Only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will 
command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, declares the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. I think that's a promise for you today. I think that's a word for us. And I want you to see this. It encourages a lot of, it promises a lot of really cool things, but it commands us to move into the place of dwelling in God's presence. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, if you make the Most High your refuge, even the, your dwelling, even the Lord, the Lord who is my refuge. And so my prayer for you this week would be that you would find the opportunity to dwell in God. So I'm, I'm done. I mean, we're going we're gonna to shut down this live stream in a few minutes. But if you're in your homes today, and I, I imagine you are, I want to encourage you to do a couple things. And the first is, is to maybe consider having a bit of worship. And I think you can actually do that in your home. Technology has made a way for us to do that like never before, even if you're not a musician, don't have a, don't have a band, <laughs> you know, at your disposal in your living room, but you do have, all of us have access, a lot of us have access to YouTube. And um, there are some great, great, great worship moments. I would suggest two of them. And the first one is, and you can just simply type this in, in YouTube and it'll, it'll come up. And I have it down here so I get it right. It's called Stand in Your Love, in brackets, Bye Bye Fear. And it's about a, I think it's about a 15 minute worship moment that's captured out of a Bethel church um, Sunday gathering and led by Corey Asbury and, and Brandon, pulling a blank, Lake, Brandon Lake, on whom I have a man crush right now. I just love this guy's worship leading. Anyways, um, the, other, the other video, stay focused now, <laughs> stay focused. The other video is a new song that Brandon Lake wrote with Stephen Furtick just recently and a few others. And it's called, um, it's called Graves to Gardens. Unbelievable song. I have literally had it on repeat for the last three days. It's the most incredible moment. So if you, if you YouTube Graves to Gardens, you'll get that live moment in Elevation Church. And it's just so encouraging and so powerful. So I would encourage you this morning, I mean, you can have, if you, if, you, if you feel so inclined to have a bit of a worship time, don't just watch the videos, actually embrace the, the moment. And, and the, the word of God is still true, whether you're in a gathering like this or you're in a small gathering with your family, that God inhabits the praises of his people. So go there. And the second thing I want to encourage you with today is to take some time to just pray. Um, whatever you think of President Trump in the U.S., I know there's lots of opinions out there, but I, I think it's a really cool thing that he has down there called today a, a national day of prayer. And when I saw that, I thought, oh yeah, what a good thing to do when there's turmoil and everybody's freaking out and there's panic everywhere. By the way, can you just be counterculture in Fort St. John Evangel? Be counterculture, don't embrace the panic. If you're, in, if you're at the store buying something and somebody comes along and they need toilet paper and you have the last box, give them the box of toilet paper. Don't be, don't be selfish in this season. We need to be the very opposite if we're going to be like Jesus. There was not a selfish bone in his body. He was, was selfless. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. And so I just, just that was just a random one-off thought. But I think it's really cool that, that today is being called as a day of prayer in the U.S. And I, I think a lot of Canadians are doing the same thing. They're saying, yeah, let's make this a day of prayer. So in your home to this morning, this is church today. Many of you have set this time aside anyways to gather. Why don't you spend some time with your family? Maybe you're with your spouse. Um, maybe you're with a few friends. Maybe you're with your family. Even if you're alone, that's totally fine. Take some time to pray and join thousands who are praying today around the globe. And I would say make your prayer, your prayer focus threefold. The first is pray for nurses and doctors. And uh, we've obviously, you, you'll never go wrong in Fort St. John with our current situation um, being so understaffed. You'll never go wrong praying for our hospital and praying for our medical system and praying for um, the professionals that work there, the people that work there, doctors, nurses, et cetera. So I would say that would be your first point of attack. Really feel like in 2020, 
We're going to see some breakthrough in our, in our hospital situation. I really believe that. I feel like God has spoken some things very clearly to me around that. So that would be the first thing. Pray for doctors and nurses. If you know any of them, pray for them by name. Pray, pray for, for health and pray for healing over our city along with that. Um, the, know this, that Jesus is very passionate about healing and health. Otherwise, why would he have spent so much of his three and a half years of ministry ministering healing to people one at a time? He's passionate about that. So you're just engaging the passion of Jesus when you pray for that over our city. So pray for our doctors and nurses and pray for the health of our city. The second thing is pray for those that are in positions of authority. Um, man, we have, we've got a great team of people in our own city here, our municipal government. Um, Lori Ackerman, our mayor, a great, a great team around her as, as aldermen, counselors. Let's pray for them that they have the wisdom they need to make the choices that are needed to be made. And let's pray and support and speak life over them. Um, it, this is the time where everybody is obviously going to be, these are difficult days and difficult decisions need to be made. Not everybody's going to be happy. There's going to be stuff that happens that you don't agree with, but would you just speak life? Just speak life, just speak life, just speak life. And, and that goes without saying on social media, speak life, speak life, speak life. Be positive, man. Be counterculture in a sea of fear. Um, speak life. So the, pray, let's pray for our, our municipal government. Let's pray for our provincial government. Let's pray for our, our federal government. We do this every time we come to a prayer summit. We, we refuse to not do this. This is, a part, this is what God calls us to do in Romans I think it's chapter 14, but it's to pray for those in positions of authority. And so we're going to do that. We're going to pray for our own leaders. We're going to pray for Bob Zimmer, who, who's a part of our church here, our MP, Dan Davies, our MLA. Um, and we're going to pray for our prime minister as well, Justin Trudeau. We're just going to pray that God gives him a spirit of wisdom. And we're going to pray he, he, health and healing over him and his wife as well. That's the second thing. So first, let's just Let's pray for our, 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 our hospital, doctors and nurses. Secondly, let's pray for our, those in government positions of authority. And third, let's pray over our church. Yeah, I'm calling you to do that. I'm calling you as a house to selfishly pray for Evangel. Pray that in these days we, we hear perfectly what God is saying to the church. He has a specific message to us. If Revelations 2 and 3 tells us anything, it's that Jesus actually wants to lead the church and direct the church in this day. Pray that we hear. Pray that we have the courage to follow. Pray that we are able to be what Jesus talked about, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. That we would be able to let our light shine. That we would be able to be agents of the kingdom. And that means that we bring joy. That brings, means that we bring love. That means that we live out peace in the culture that we're in and we make a difference. So, so pray that. And obviously, as a, as a leadership at Evangel, we would appreciate your prayers for us as we continue to, to stay close to Jesus and hear where he's taken us as a church. I'm going to pray, and then um, you can kind of launch into whatever you want to do around that. But I would encourage you to spend some time worshiping and then some time praying together. It's a new season, man. It's a new day. If you've never done this in your home before, this is the time to start it. This is the time to go somewhere new. So, God, I thank you right now for what you're doing in this, this time. And, man, I... I felt like coming into 2020, like this was going to be a unique year for us. And 2019 for a lot of us was a difficult year. And we, we looked ahead to 2020 as being a year of clarity and vision and dreams fulfilled. And I do, to the bottom of my heart, believe that is actually going to be our reality in 2020. But it was interesting. We also sensed as we came into 2020 that it wouldn't be without some difficulty. And so here we are in this season. Life is disruptive. For some of us, we're pretty concerned about the economy and what's going on in Fort St. John's oil and, oil and gas industry. And there, there is uncertainty for sure. But we just declare right now, we declare right now that you are the God of life. You are the God of the impossible. Jesus, I love the fact that as we look through the, the, the narratives in the Old Testament and New Testament, a lot of times it seems like you actually delight in prospering our lives in the seasons that, are, that seem like droughts, in the seasons that are, difficult, that are difficult. It just seems like you love doing that. You love bringing, singing songs of deliverance over us when we're surrounded by enemies. You love coming in to the lion's, the lion's den, as it were, and they're bringing deliverance, shutting the mouths of the lions. It's just the way you operate. And so I pray that for us as a church, we would have great expectation and great hope for what you're doing in the season and for what you're going to do in our lives. We, have, we know 
that you have an amazing, amazing plan for our church. We know that you have an amazing plan for our city. We see it shaping up around us that God, you are bringing heaven to earth in Fort St. John. And we believe globally you're doing something really cool. And so God, would you let hope arise in our hearts? We just speak against the spirit of fear. We just declare that unequivocally um, fear has no place in our lives. So we pray that you would, um, that you would literally just drive out any fear that your love would drive out fear in our lives and that we would instead get from you a spirit of power and of love and of soundness of mind in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I pray, God, over the house, I pray blessing today. I pray, God, that wherever we go, whether it's to the grocery store later on today or whether it's meeting somebody on the street or having somebody into our homes, that we would be conduits of your spirit's work. God, would you heal people I, we pray that as we, as we encounter people that are not feeling well, that, that are sick, would you just heal people through our prayers? God, would you, would you bring life and peace and joy through our lives into the world around us? We just want to be a blessing, and we know that, God, that's what you bless us for. It's not, just a, it's not just for us to hoard the blessing and hide behind the four walls of our homes. It's for us to be a blessing to the world around us. So I pray that, God, in this season, for us as a church, we would be a blessing more than we've ever been before to this city and to the, to, the, to the world around us. So I pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's been good hanging out um, virtually. By, I'm not walking by sight. I'm walking by faith that you're out there somewhere. I hope you have an amazing day. Keep, keep posted. Again, get the Tidely app. Download that thing. And um, get on the Facebook page. Like the Facebook page. And we will we'll stay connected. It's, there's good days ahead, man. I'm telling you, we're, we're, we're excited about what God is doing and what he's going to do. So be blessed. I'll sign up for now. Have a great afternoon.